Mr. Martin, this is about some pledges that uh, we're asking all of those who are going to be involved in the election and who are seeking office uh, to make about tertiary education in New Zealand. Um, and the first of them is we're asking you to support accessible and inclusive quality public tertiary education as it's set out in the government's new tertiary education strategy and the reforms of vocational education. And to ensure that you'll do the following to make this vision live. Right. And that is, first of all, to require a new funding model that prioritises domestic students and skills required in Aotearoa, and which recognises the actual cost of running provision, whether mm. that's on job, on campus or online. Um, and to ask that that be in place by the beginning of 2022, that is to say by the end of 2021, to, take, mm. to, to have effect in 2022. The current time frame is the end of 2024. We're saying that's much too long. Right. Um, well, so there's a couple of things in there. First of all, to support accessible and inclusive quality public tertiary education. Yes, New Zealand First um, has had a commitment to that for a long time. Um, and I think um, our tertiary policy, which is the upfront investment policy that I released in 2017, which would take away all student debt, actually goes to it being more accessible and being more inclusive. So I think, I think we've um, proven that on a couple of um, levels. Um, and of course, you know, funding model that prioritises domestic students and skills. So domestic students, we are New Zealand first, so that would be the first thing. Yeah. Um, and we have to remove the sector's dependency on foreign students. So foreign students should be the cream on the cake, right? Yeah. They shouldn't be what is the main ingredient keeping your cake going. Um, so, so we're very, very focused on using the COVID opportunity to reset international students, which means reset the funding model for what is our domestic provision, so it's not dependent upon that. Um, or, and, and also using that international student, the levy at the moment that we have got in place for international students does not actually support provision for domestic students, and it should. So it should be able to be used for that, not just a minimal levy that is used to promote more foreign students coming to New Zealand. That's our view. And the skills required in Aotearoa New Zealand, so again, we've been since the previous government re re uh, removed the, um, the responsibility for workforce planning completely from anybody in the sector, it used to be with ITOs and then they took it all away, um, we've advocated to have that workforce planning back, which means that we would actually get a picture across New Zealand of the skills that our people need so they can find employment because at the end of the day, we want our people to not go through a whole period of study and then find that they can't find employment at the end of it. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, look, we're very much on the same page with yeah. that. That's great. Um, and yes, we hope that that relation between Workforce Development Councils and regional schools mm -hmm. leadership groups, we should get that workforce planning happening. Well, again, there's, there's another bit though that's in the tertiary policy that I've got. Um, and that is that we would require, the funding model would require the Workforce Development Councils, the Regional Skills Leadership and all government departments to do a five-year projection of their workforce, required workforce, plus a 20-year vision. We need to know what's going to be coming in and what's going to be going out. Because if we really start to look at what our tertiary, um, our tertiary provision needs to be providing, it's at no matter what age, can you dip in and dip out? Can you continue to upskill over life? And that has to be recognised in the funding model, but also through this area of employment is going to phase out, but this is going to be an area that we could switch over that workforce to yeah. the training in the interim. Yeah, great. I mean, and that ties in with the sort of future of work. And exactly, because I'm the minister who sits, I, I sit on that as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Well, another uh, key element we see that, that would support that accessible and inclusive Public, uh, publicly funded tertiary mm -hmm. education is increasing the funding of the tertiary education sector to 2.7% of GDP by 2024 mm -hmm. so that it, funding covers the true cost of an accessible and inclusive yeah. system across all communities in Aotearoa. I think at the moment it's about 1.8%. Yeah, I mean, I did that in the numbers like when I wrote the original policy. So um, in 2016, tertiary investment by the New Zealand government was 1.67% of GDP. What we had back in 2000, um, well, much earlier, was around 2.1, 2.2. So there would definitely been a cut during that period of the, of, well, of the national government, really. Um, so I've worked my policy out to try and get our spend back up to 2% of GDP, recognising that GDP prior to COVID had risen from, I think it was 
200 and around 265 billion in 2016, it was up around 315 billion mm. in 20, March 2020 before we started to get the drop off. So why am I putting all those numbers out there? Because I'd rather commit to what it actually costs than saying this is a cap on what we're going to spend. Right? So I believe with my workings that if we started to shift up towards 2% of GDP, which was around about in that 260 to 270 billion mark, we can actually remove student debt and provide the opportunities we need. I'm not opposed to looking at your numbers for 2.7%, absolutely not opposed, because that investment has got to deliver what the country wants. And if we front end the investment, there will be savings over here for the nation. So we're just really shifting money from one place to another, I think. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. I mean, it, it's worth noting, isn't it, that that huge increase in GDP occurred also while there was a big increase in population. True, it was built off the back of immigration. So mm. what we've got is what's really interesting, if we only get a 15% drop in GDP, it takes us back to still more than we had in 2016, but we ha now haven't got all their numbers of immigration. So I agree, we've got to rework the numbers. And, I, and I'm, as I say, I'm not opposed to having a look at that 2.7%. I just, I'd need to see your numbers, uh, where yeah. that came from. Fair enough. Um, the, the third element that we're asking about is the removing unnecessary auditing measures. Mm. That's um, performance, uh, education performance indicators, right. and so on, affecting um, funding. Yeah. And of course, the, the, the very small margin of undershooting or overshooting yeah. or projected enrolments. Um, we think that, you know, we've, we've got a temporary suspension of those yeah. rules and we'd like to see that extended. Oh, no, it needs to be extended. I mean, we, you know, New Zealand First required this government to have a, convers a, a conversation to set a 30-year vision for education about what success looks like. Mm -hmm. And because we've all decided that success is much more holistic around supporting the human being and so on inside mm -hmm. the education setting, that the assessments that controlled funding were very much not based on actually what was the best for the human being to, to allow them to be their best. Mm -hmm. It was um, a tick box sort of data uh, process by a government to, in a negative way, really hold people accountable for spend. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a more constructive way to hold people accountable, not just for the dollar spent, but actually how have these human beings supported to be their best right. by the system? Right? Yeah, they were more financial performance in the case. Yeah, yeah, at the end of the day. Mm. Yeah, great. Look, um, the, the second main area we wanted to ask you about is equitable workplaces in the tertiary mm. education sector. Um, paying a living wage. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, so this is a question I'd put back to your membership actually. Why do we have a minimum wage? So, and this is a conversation you and I think have had before. Mm. Um, where, so we've got legislation that, that places a minimum wage and New Zealand first when we came in we said this has got to actually be lifted over the next three years closer to what was the living wage at the time so it has to go to $20 um, on an hour by July next year yeah. right um, so that was a requirement of our coalition agreement um, and we did that because we wanted to try and get towards the living wage so my question is should we actually be changing the legislation from a minimum wage to a living wage is the legislation itself wrong? Because we've got this two, these two markers in the sand. And if the minimum wage isn't enough to live on, why does the state say that that's what you can pay somebody? So it's a conversation we'd like to have, I think is what we're saying, all right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we need to acknowledge that New Zealand First has always set good targets for the minimum mm -hmm. wage. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it looked like it was catching up to the living wage for a while there, but the living wage yeah. moved ahead a bit more I this know, year than, than previously. But look, thank you, that's a really good point, and I'm sure members will be interested in that. Um, addressing inequality in the tertiary education sector by requiring investment plans to include equity implement implementation plans yeah. for Māori, women and Pacifica staff and learners, mm -hmm. and ensuring there is funding to achieve these plans. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, absolutely supportive. We spoke about it the other night when we were on the um, women's panel. Um, I'd be interested to know why there's a need for more resourcing to fund these plans, because I think we were talking about Massey, University um, had done this and they had seen quite a dramatic change because they now had a focus on it. I did it in the reading that I've done around that. I don't recall them having to receive any further funding from the state to do it. Mm. So um, 
that would I'd be interested in it. I'm not opposed to saying that they need more resourcing. I'd just really like to know why it's not part of their standard business now. Um, the only other thing I would say about this too is I am a bit of a proponent that um, inside legislation for the Ministry of Education, TEC, Police, um, Health, everything, I think they need a 7AA clause in the same way that Oranga Tamariki has. And I think that there needs to be a requirement not only to um, address the equity issues that we know are across every single one of our um, government funded sectors, but that actually they have to publicly report on it and what they're doing about it. Um, so yeah, Great. so supportive inside those organisations, but actually I'd like to see it wider across all government funded organisations. Great. Great. Well, look, thank you very much, Mr. Martin. That's been wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you.